Stan Jabalisco here. Uh, we're going to continue with our little tutorial sequence of videos for the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, published by McGraw-Hill in October of 2013, the third edition edited by me with some uh, enhancements and advancements over and above the previous editions, mainly involving completely redrawn artwork and the addition of little blurbs called Follow the Flow or entitled Follow the Flow. This was something that reviewers had asked for. Here's an example right here on page 76. It refers to figure 4-17 which is a generic uh, amplifier circuit broadband amplifier circuit, something that you might use, for example, to amplify the signal from a microphone, or you could use it as the basis for a radio frequency preamplifier. On page 77, you will find an example of the same type of amplifier with some specific component values. Uh, so you can get this book it has a spiral binding, paper version does, workbench friendly, requires no boot up, no batteries, acquires no bugs nor viruses, and if you spill your diet Mountain Dew on it, all it'll get is wet. Again, the Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, third edition. Uh, this video is in the sequence entitled Beginner's Schematics. So if you go to my YouTube channel, the main channel uh, directory there, and seek out the playlist Beginner's Schematics, you'll find other videos in regards to this book there. But I'd like to deal right now with how the currents and signals flow through figure 4-17, or rather through the circuit depicted by figure 4-17. There is a rather detailed description in the book of how that works, but I'd like to draw a somewhat simplified version of this diagram, the generic NPN transistor uh, amplifier circuit. So I'd like to actually go through and start out drawing it. Note the quadrille paper uh, as I've alluded to in other videos in this sequence, that's really nice for drawing schematic diagrams by hand. It helps you to keep your lines more or less perpendicular to one another the way that they should be in most cases. So here we have the NPN bipolar transistor. Does that look like an arrow pointing out? I'm doing my best there. This is the em emitter, the base, and the collector. So the collector here goes along through a capacitor to the output. Notice I've included a grounded terminal at the input and a grounded terminal at the output indicating an unbalanced load and an unbalanced input. So there's our input capacitor. We put a resistor between the base and ground and another resistor between the base and the positive power supply. Now the values of these capacitors should be chosen in such a way that this base here will be biased in such a way as to produce a class A amplifier. That means that it will conduct current, the transistor will conduct current during the entire input cycle. In order to assist with that biasing to ensure proper biasing. We put a resistor in series with the emitter and a capacitor across that resistor. Now the purpose of this capacitor here 
across this resistor is to provide a good DC bias for the transistor without letting signal flow and disrupt the operation of the transistor by kind of a bounce back effect that you would get. You, you input your AC signal here and it's a fairly weak little signal like that. Hopefully if we design our amplifier properly at the output we will get a strong signal. Same frequency, same waveform, but a lot stronger, we hope. So the signal goes in here and it reaches the base. Well, we need to provide a path somehow for current to flow through this transistor to make it work. Otherwise, we're not going to have any performance at all. So what we do is connect the positive 12 volts the, or whatever the power supply voltage happens to be, 9, 12, 15 volts, sometimes upwards of 20 volts, sometimes only maybe 3 or 6 volts, depends on the device. Anyway, we have then current flowing through the transistor all the time. Electrons going, remember electrons go from minus to plus. This is in effect the negative ground here. Electrons flowing through like that. The AC signal on here on the base causes the amplitude of that current to fluctuate. Hopefully the amplitude out here will result in a much greater signal voltage than it was at the input. These capacitors allow the signal to pass through, but they prevent the direct current bias from messing up the input or messing up the output, that is to say messing up whatever precedes the amplifier or messing up whatever follows the amplifier, but signals can get through here. These are known as blocking capacitors because they block the DC. This is a bypass capacitor because it's intended to bypass any signal that might disrupt the operation of this transistor. We don't want the input signal to be reflected back into this emitter part of the circuit. Now the diagram in the book shows some test points, TP1, TP2, and TP3. I'm not going to include those here because they would simply clutter things up. Basically then, what we have here is the complete amplifier circuit. The signal comes in here, affects the current that flows through this transistor, and we choose the value of this resistor so that as the current fluctuates, flowing like this, as the current fluctuates, it produces a voltage across this resistor that fluctuates to a much greater extent than the voltage fluctuated at the input. So this is a voltage amplifier, even though the transistor itself is a current valve of sorts. So this is a Class A broadband amplifier. Now, broadband doesn't mean it'll amplify everything from DC to light. It means though that it will uh, amplify over a considerable range of frequencies determined by the values of the components. In general, the larger the capacitances, the lower the frequency that it's intended to work at. Conversely, the smaller the capacitances, the higher the frequency it's intended to work at. These resistors right here help to determine the input and output impedance as well. So we get a fluctuating current through this resistor right here. Fluctuating current. Actually the electrons always flow down 
in this particular diagram, but they flow to a greater or lesser extent. So what we get here actually is a varying direct current. This blocking capacitor gets rid of the direct current component, leaving only the alternating current signal at the output. So that is figure 4-17. in this book, once again, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics and Drawing Them, by the way. Until the next video, have fun. So long.